welcome to another episode of WMA Events, online talks with artists and specialists, um, where we talk about things that are extremely important to us and our museum. WMA um, is a virtual museum of Anthropocene. Uh, my name is Karolina Raczynska and I will be talking to Pierre Leichner today about his exhibited artworks, his artistic practice in a context of the migration exhibition and about migration itself. Migration is a massive topic and it's, uh, you know, it's very important to all of us, but some of us are migrants. I'm a migrant, here is a migrant, and we're going to talk about his work and his past, his experiences and what he's doing and how he's, he wants to talk about extremely important things. Let me just um, say some things about Pierre before we say hello to each other. Um, Pierre is an interdisciplinary artist who, after some years of working in science, decided to become a full-time artist uh, with a socially engaged practice. He received his BFA from Emily Carr in 2007 and MFA from Concordia University in 2011. His works focus on environmental and mental health issues. He is a member of the Gallery Gachet Collective, the Art is Land Collective, a, a board member of the Community Arts Council of Vancouver and on the Senate of America University. Hello, Pierre. Absolutely yes. fantastic to see you. Thank you again, Caroline. Thank you. Sure. Um, you submitted um, two artworks and a video installation, mm -hmm. um, as well as your um, talk about yourself as a, you know, as a migrant. I would like to start with the video installation uh, that is absolutely fantastic and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. uh, Maddie the sorrows he suffered at sea. Um, this is the work that's been made in 2018. And I would like you to talk about it. And if it's okay, after you talk about it, I'm going to show it to everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, first, let me thank you and Agnes and all those at the museum for making this show uh, so beautiful and so current and so important. Uh, great work. Uh, the first thing I want to do is actually do a land acknowledgement. In Canada, what we've been trying to do traditionally is before we start any presentation is to acknowledge the land we live on. And in this case, I'm privileged to live on Squamish territory, unceded territory, which means it has been stolen from this by the settlers when they came in and invaded this territory. And what they did then, of course, is remove the indigenous population. Uh, among other things, they reserve, put them into camps, reserves. Uh, 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 and uh, this process is ongoing right now. It's still there. We still have reserves in this country. And some of these areas, like camps, are underfunded, under-resourced educationally, and so on. And people have difficulty. And, and we are still creating, perpetuating the damages of these practices um, of, uh, uh, in our, in, during the, our times. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to say is that this issue of migration, immigration, is has been with us since during the Holocene. It's not just an Anthropocene phenomena uh, or Capitalocene, if you want to call it that way. Uh, it's something that human the human condition has been done for many many uh, centuries uh, in response to climate change in response to social, economic, religious, and political reasons. So it's an ongoing issue with, uh, with us, and it's, it's so tragic that we haven't yet come to terms in understanding that this is a permanent nature of all organisms on the planet. All the organisms on the planet, even probably inorganic uh, materials, are continuously moving around, and we are the creation of this process. And rather than you know, suffering with it, we should be really understanding and engaging it. However, having said that, uh, how did I come about? Uh, one of my parts of my practice is to only engage in making work that I can embody, that I can understand myself. So uh, 
I was able to do this work because I have a history of migration, immigration in myself, in my body, and in my family. Uh, the story, my story starts actually in 1947, just when I was born uh, in Transylvania, Moravia. At that time, the Soviet occupation of Romania was coming to an end through, uh, and the Communist Party was being voted in, and my parents at that point uh, decided to escape or to leave. And uh, my parents and my grandparents. My, gra my parents uh, emigrated and my, found their way to France. My grandparents found their way to Italy. So there was a border issue. And uh, in order to be reunited, my grandparents in Italy had to cross the border as refugees into, into France. And they, they had to do it illegally. So the first try was actually by boat. And they, you know, got involved in a smuggler and got a boat and tragically the boat sank. And in fact, what I have here, if you can see, is an image of my grandparents being rescued by French and Italian po police at the time from the boat that was sinking. And this is a newspaper from uh, called the La Dominica del Corrieri of December 1948. So that's the time my grandparents almost drowned at sea, but they were, re they were rescued and they were brought back to Italy, still in Italy. So the next step was very briefly, my, my father came over with the passport of my mother, my, mo my grandmother dyed her hair, went back to France with my father as her, as her his wife. My grandfather was stuck in Italy. He had to cross, he hired a smuggler, took him to walk across the Alps, same story, somewhere around halfway, the smuggler says, you're on your own. And my grandfather had to walk the rest out of the Alps on his own. Fortunately, they were reunited and we were all together in France. The second chapter of my story is that in 1956, the Russians or the rather the Soviets invaded Hungary. And at that point, my uncle, my aunt and my cousins came over to Canada as refugees. Later on, uh, my parents separated and my mother uh, in France at the time and I, uh, she decided, and my grandparents decided that it was, uh, we would have more opportunities at that point to come to live in, in, uh, in Canada and uh, being invited by my cousin and uh, my aunt and uncle, we came over to Canada where I am right now. And I've been here uh, since the age of 13. So it's been uh, quite a long time. So that's the story that I, I I have and that uh, that I can relate to. So fast forward to 2018, Kefalonia. Uh, I'm doing a sound art workshop there, residency. And uh, we one of those days we go to a, a little port, a little village, a little port. And I learned that in that port, uh, a large, uh, significant number of, of refugees landed uh, on this Greek island of Kefalonia. Uh, they were taken and detained in this little house. There's a little kind of house on on, on the uh, the port site that's closed and bar barred all up. Uh, they were detained there. Uh, smugglers approached them again, and this time some smugglers approached them and promised them to take them the next step to Europe. And some of those people agreed and paid. Tragically, that boat sank and those people drowned and were washed back up to Catalonia. So that was the event that I, by uh, in a way by chance, was well, found myself in and uh, with a microphone and a, and a camera. And uh, so that's the connection that resonated with me on the site. And uh, that's led me to do the piece of work that is now in the show, the video. It is a kind of multidisciplinary. It was shown in, in the art center, the Ionian Art Center of Catalonia. It's a multidisciplinary show because I believe in doing things involving more than one sense in the art I make to get people to connect to it because we all connect in different ways. So there is sound and there is obviously visual uh, component. Uh, but at the, at the uh, installation in Kefalonia, there was also pieces of debris that I found around the, uh, the site flakes of paint, so paint, rusted pieces that had come down. They were probably there when the event occurred. So they well, hold in this 
object, they hold the memory of the event. So I, I arranged those in kind of an archaeological museum-like fashion because we often do this when we do things, we look archaeologically to the past, we kind of order it, make sense of it in a kind of a, a scientific way. Uh, and it kind of gives us a sense, it allows us to distance ourselves a bit from the thing as well, uh, emotionally. And then I put some, uh, made some water that tasted like salt water, like the sea uh, that people could taste, and also some uh, dust and wood dust that I found there that gave the smell, a bit of the smell of the place. So kind of doing this multidisciplinary thing. Obviously on the video, you can't have those two components, but you can see at the end a bit of what it looked like. Uh, and uh, so that uh, led me eventually to, the, to this uh, work that's at a very privileged to have in your show. That, um, so, I, uh, is it okay if I show it now? It's, um, I think so. Um, it's it's absolutely heartbreaking. It's extremely intense. Even though you you as you say, we can only see and hear it. It mm -hmm. still leaves us really astonished and tormented. Um, so, I I would love to see it. Um, the way it was shown but right. unfortunately this is all we have but yes. it's still going to be fantastic just let me just share it um here um give me a sec oh just somehow it just disappeared <laughs> Give me a second. I will. I will be there with you in a moment. Um, okay, because it's here. I have. I feel. I feel like I have too many things open at the same time. Um, okay. Mm. It doesn't allow me to show it. I don't know why. I it's quite okay. This is a problem now. Hmm. I have a link to the video. Okay. Accept it. <laughs> Please work. Okay. Hmm. Now, technical issues always. Thank you.
Let me just uh, um, so it's it's even though we cannot taste, even though we cannot smell it, mm -hmm. just the sound and just the image is is, is a very powerful tool. So um, how did people, how did the audience um, receive this um, artwork, this whole experience? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think uh, at the moment. I'm told that everybody was really touched, uh, you know, on being part of the presentation of there. But I think I'm told by th that uh, people there was silence. There was uh, it, it connected for people emotionally, uh, particularly those that lived on the island who actually had experienced the uh, the event and uh, and the tragedy. So it it, it did connect, which is uh, in their bodies, and which is actually for me the, the what art does is allows us to connect emotionally with facts, with stories. Um, so it, it was powerful and the outcome of it, I think, uh, partly anyways, I'm being reinvited to Catalonia uh, this uh, fall to do a workshop there on uh, environmental art and um, bio art and, uh, and community engaged art. So so obviously they, it seemed like it touched them and they thought it was, um, it was meaningful. Um, yeah, so I think it did. It, 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 it was successful in that sense. Um, immigration is such a big topic, and the migrant crisis seems like been happening uh, forever. Mm. Um, we at every single time I think of the migrant crisis, I'm thinking about what's happening now, what's ha been happening for the last fifteen years, and it's just a, an ongoing thing. How, like, if we talking about a crisis, um, why? Is the permanent situation for um, many um, people? Um, we do. Lots of us um, identify as migrants. I'm a migrant. Mm -hmm. You're a migrant. I think. Um, mm -hmm. And then lots of our um, part of our audiences are migrants. Lots of our, our um, artists are migrants. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the the topic you're talking about, the the problem, uh, the the artwork. The, the topic that you touch with um, Catalonia artwork mm -hmm. is something bigger. This is not migration that I experienced, that my grandfather experienced. This is something that your grandparents did experience. This is something mm -hmm. extremely um, difficult and extremely um, harsh. And, and then because we've been facing this issue, um, we've been facing this crisis, um, 
as an audience, as part of, because we read it on the media, we see it on the media, it becomes like a regular thing because it's a part of a landscape right now for us, all mm. the suffering and all that am amazing emotion and what happens next. Um, when, um, so I was thinking that it is extremely important to have artworks like this because they touch the, the essence, the, the, the very um, solid thing of the migration, something that we don't think of because we, you work with um, sensations almost, with what's left, what's there, and I really love it. It's uh, heartbreaking and it's absolutely fantastic. But I would like to talk about other artworks that you showed. Um, for anyone that um, is for the first time here, um, I would like to say that uh, Pierre is um, is our, let's say, a regular artist because we've seen your works before. Um, and that's great. Uh, it's absolutely fabulous. We're going to talk about uh, something else at the end of um, our talk because I need to mention it, uh, Dr. Legum. But um, let's talk about something more serious, um, the two artworks that you created for us um, um, and you showed just um, at the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, I have them. If I have a chance, I will be able to see, uh, show it mm -hmm. um, to uh, everyone. However, as we've noticed before, that there, there are some, I have, I'm facing some, the technical difficulties right now. So for the um, migration exhibition, migration exhibition, you create, um, you showed us two um, artworks, um, immigration three and five. Um, what I want to talk about is, um, if I if I manage to show them, it's absolutely fantastic. If not, please forgive me, but I do my best. Um, I would like to talk about what inspired you to create them, these artworks, and about the whole series, and about materials that you use um, to work with, and what you are trying to say, and what you, what sort of discussion, if any, you want to start with these artworks, because I feel like they're extremely powerful, um, and so Immigration 3 and Immigration 5, right. if I could ask about that, ask about them. Thank you. Well, as you said, uh, migration is, uh, is if our human condition, it's our history, it's our, in our being, it's not new at all. So why is it that it is still so, we struggle with it and uh, so much suffering is associated, human su suffering is associated with it? Because it's not going to stop. I mean, if it just political, it's social, religion, it's not going to stop, but yet we, why is it that as a human uh, species we have so much difficulty with it? And uh, I think part of this, part of the uh, the uh, uh, story is that humans, obviously, as as you know, we we have a dark side. We have the the best and the worst is within us, and uh, we are also a very territorial species, and uh, it's only actually the last few hundred years, maybe thousand years, that that uh, humans have become kind of much more territorially based. You know, until then it was just kind of no, taken that you would be moving. You're, you know, you had to move due to climate. I mean, there was no, you're, you know, you could set up a camp here and then at some point you had to move somewhere else because of climate. It was, a, that's how you survived. But we became, as we evolved, we became able to stay in one place. I said, this is my land, this is mine. I don't have to move. I can stay here the whole year round. And that process uh, became, again, this territorial um, ability uh, and that has been amplified during the capital scene or the Anthropocene, where we really become like uh, the territory, Earth becomes commodity, it's ours, you know, it's, uh, we believe it's ours. And that becomes, again, the idea that it's, we have to protect it and we have to keep it, that other people want to come in, we have to control all of that. So all that kind of thinking is, is being amplified in this, uh, and uh, over the last few hundred years. Uh, and along with that becomes again this, uh, this position that uh, people don't have right, other humans do not have uh, uh, the right to come in, or they do not have for whatever reason, they have to, um, we have to protect what we have. So this idea that we're not one big family on the 
one fragile planet, you know, which, God, we should understand by now, this idea is just not uh, embraced. So we kind of, and, and, the, and, and because climate change or political changes make us more defend, more um, stressed, we become even more uh, territorial. And with that comes the worst of us. That comes the, the worst of, our, of, of what we can do to each other and to other humans. Uh, and, and the idea of sharing and that kind of thing goes boom, you know, it, it becomes very difficult. And we, then we set up. And uh, as I said earlier, in Canada, we've set up reserves and we set up all form. And this is not just Canada, of course, it's around the world. All the colonial countries have done it and do it and, and reap the, and reap the, uh, the damage of that. They reap, they reap the suffering that this eventually passes down for generations. Uh, and we are doing it right now. We are setting up uh, refugees camps all over the world, uh, millions. So size of country, uh, people are in refugee camps. And we will inherit um, the suffering and the, and the harm that living in these camps can uh, um, for, century, for generations onward. And that will keep on us going and, and creating more uh, inequity and, and problems and anger and violence. So it's it's a very sad um, thing to to uh, to witness. Um, so the work I uh, the next step I took and it was in the back of my mind was again to try to how to portray how to uh, talk about uh, these refugee camps uh, in a way an artistic way and uh, my practice. Uh, tends to be uh, one of uh, combining, well, first thing, uh, when I think of the viewer, I, I like to kind of almost intrigue uh, the attention, seduce the attention of the viewer by an object or by uh, a, uh, uh, an artwork, uh, and to attract them to it and have them kind of uh, be questioned and, and be puzzled by it in a way, so that at first they do not necessarily uh, see what the uh, what the artwork is is about. So and but when they come closer and they start looking at the materials that are used, they start making connections as to what it is. And then it doesn't look perhaps as um, if you want beautiful or pretty or whatever. It becomes more uh, again flips onto the dark side of the of the of the work. So uh, the other thing I do in my practice, being interdisciplinary. I use a multiplicity of materials. So when I think of a project, I don't right away think of a media. I might think of, uh, the, I think of uh, finding out more about it, and I think of, uh, of the components that are what the, uh, what is happening, the materials that are in that actual uh, issue. So when I thought of uh, working around the, uh, the issue of refugee camps, uh, and that, yeah, so I, I thought immediately of, well, okay, we're talking about walls, we're talking about concrete sometimes, cement, we're talking about barbed wire, of course, uh, uh, tragically, and we are also talking about migration moving and uh, walking and shoelaces. So uh, this is what drew me to, uh, to this series of work that is ongoing. I'll show you another piece of work I'm doing right now, because once you start a project, you kind of, particularly when you working with new material that you never worked before, you kind of learn, okay, this does this and that does this, and you move it always a step forward and so further and further. So this is an ongoing project. These are two of the first uh, pieces that I did. Uh, and what I also, because I, was, I had this environmental kind of um, value concern, uh, I use um, materials that I found in recycling bins as the molds for the sculptures. So here in, in Vancouver, we have recycling bins. So people have the plastic and anything that you get that is uh, sometimes packaged, uh, they throw this out in this bin. And so I go around and I find these often they wonderful kind of shapes that, uh, that are there. And, and they can be like egg cartons, they can be candy boxes and so on. So I use these mold, mold, molds, uh, recycle, repurpose them. And I, uh, in this case, put uh, poured uh, uh, cement. Sometimes I can color the cement uh, and as the actual sculptural ob object. Uh, then 
attached to the somewhere at some point i i would also um uh, put uh, some barbed wire and attached to the barbed wire are shoelaces and this one in this image it was it evokes to me a bit the tent cities uh that you might see uh in refugee camps um so here for example i just i will show you uh right now if you want as well Here's another. I'm just working on this piece right now, uh, and yep. it's a bit of a larger piece, and you can see the barbed wire around it. And this time, I'm experimenting with the uh, with the shoelaces in the way that they look a bit as if wind was blowing through them, or there was smoke. So it's a, it looks a little more um, prison-like and monumental as a piece, but I'm yeah. working on this one. So. I am moving along with uh, trying to make these shoelaces more sculptural and so on. But uh, uh, that's a series of works, I'm, I'm, uh, and they can be shown vertically or horizontally and so on. Uh, I'm exp expanding on um, uh, with this, these works right now. So hopefully I'll have a whole group of them that can go into a, an, into a gallery or a show at some point. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, uh, one more thing uh, for everyone that's um, listening to us, guys, if you have any questions to Pierre, um, and I guess he's a, he's a fantastic person to talk to, and if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, there's a comment section that you can write your questions, and then after the, we you know, wrap around um, our conversation, we'll be able to um, pass them on. So please... Don't hesitate to write a comment um, and we'll be more than happy to um, talk about topics that um, interest you. Um, so going back to um, your works, um, you also, apart from these two artworks that uh, we, you've seen, just seen mm -hmm. uh, on the screen and you talked about, uh, you also um, gave us your video, um, audio, um, with your own story as a migrant, um, yeah. because apart from the fact that you know you have a history, the family history of a migrant, you this is your personal um, thing for you as well, right? right. Um, we um, the migration exhibition. Um, I feel like we try to show a topic that's just so big that we manage to scratch the surface of it. Right. Because when we talk about migrations, we talk about um, human migrations, uh, uh, um, animal migration, plant migration, um, and the migration for whatever reasons. So for financial um, mm -hmm. reasons and for love interests, and then people escaping poverty, people escaping climate, people escaping war. By the way, today is the 78th day of uh, invasion. Um, so this is something that's happening right now um, around us. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, this is something that we need to talk about migration because it you know, defines all of us. Even if we personally don't migrate, some, some of our relatives could have, our neighbors, friends, um, we live in different territories. Um, and this is something that is extremely important. And then there are museums that are dedicated just to migration, the whole museums, right. not only exhibitions. So this is such a big topic. But I feel like uh, we still haven't said enough, even though we have the whole institutions, we have it in the media. And um, how do you think we should talk about migration? What shall we uh, start with? And uh, what's missing in the whole discussion of it? Um, what do you think? Mm -hmm. well, that's a very good question. Uh, well, I, I think maybe referring back to what I said earlier, first perhaps is to switch our, our position around it and our awareness that this is uh, a continuous process. It's a permanent. Yeah. Yes. It's gone. It's not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to be a point where uh, we're all going to sit in our little countries with our borders and everybody's going to be happy and nobody's going to want to, to get into the other. Um, it has always been, and it will continue to be with us. Yeah. It, 
may accelerate the the, the uh, one of the things we're noticing. Perhaps it is accelerating. Climate change is going to definitely have an impact, even if you don't want to think in terms of political. I mean, it will make people, even some areas in our world, flooding, drought, they're out, fire, are going to force people to move. Uh, they're going to be elsewhere. So taking this uh, and starting to think about it and making, um, um, how to say, to kind of prepare, preparedness is perhaps the word, to prepare ourselves for the fact that this is a, 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 a reality that's not going to go away. And uh, and how to challenge this concept again of borders and uh, walls and so on and uh, and uh, adapt to it. It's not an. It's a very difficult situation, I think, in terms of these two forces. Where, as I say, we live in the best of world and the worst of worlds. There's a world out there where we're breaking down some boundaries, and yet then we're building up others. And and you know, as soon as we Take one wall down. Somebody else wants to build another one. So it, 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 you know, it, it, certainly the, as I say, the discussion has to continue at the global level. Understanding that uh, it's not going to go away. That is, uh, that is a process. Some of this process is, if you want, natural because that's uh, the humans uh, and the organisms on the planet. And uh, how can we uh, adapt ourselves to it? Um, it's much more difficult to address this unfortunate territorial, uh, defensive, aggressive, and violent uh, aspect of our humanity. It's it's much more difficult because uh, uh, when we're living it right now. Uh, it, it, it's uh, we have for the and again we living it within with the the issues right now in Ukraine, but we also tend to forget that this has been. Go ongoing genocide and different has been ongoing for the, within our lifetime. It's not just now. It's a different part of the world. And there's another layer of complexity there where we do not pay as much attention to other parts of the world for racial reasons often, uh, where we don't count, they don't, you know, a genocide doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, seem to upset or get in the news as much. So um, it's not just now. It, it, it is an ongoing uh, tragedy around the world and it's not going to get uh, easier at some point unless we start really uh, taking a different look at it rather than defensive look. How do we prepare ourselves and how do we uh, learn to welcome or to be more open to what uh, uh, is needed to review our immigration if you want to stay within the present system. Review the immigration policies that countries have so that people can come across when it, uh, when it's needed, uh, making them more rapid and more flexible, less uh, more equitable, more fair than they have been in the past, um, less defensive. Um, you know, it, uh, Canada, among other countries, is a very large country. It has a lot of resources. These resources will become more valuable as we go forward, more likely than not, electricity, water. We have the ability to take a lot more people. We're a small population on a very large landmass. The landmass is likely going to be warming. It probably is going to become more desirable. So how do we prepare ourselves uh, and become uh, more uh, accepting, not as a, mm, as a, as a natural process, you know, something yeah. that is just the right thing to do. So it, it's... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a difficult, uh, but like I said, it has to start with de um, changing the uh, our focus, looking at this in a different way, not as a as something that uh, comes out of necessarily just suffering, but something that is, comes out of human nature, and that we have to accept and uh, become more comfortable with and learn how to manage. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I feel like um, I, I, I have this feeling that Canada is one of the countries that actually talks about migration and colonialism, let's say, in right. a very open way. Um, because what happened in Canada with indigenous, indigenous people right. is, uh, is something that happened and it's a horrible thing. But we have to talk about it, to understand it, to not 
do it, never do it again. Right. We have to talk about it. But I feel like Canada is doing the right thing. Right. Um, there are lots of countries that just don't talk about certain processes that happened in the past because we just don't want to think about it. We just don't want to, um, you know, suffer the consequences. It's better not to see and not understand. Right. Um, there are two things I want to talk a, a, as well about. Um, there's um initiative that you have that you want to work with migrant artists and you want to show their works. Right. If you could tell me about it, that's one thing. And this, the other one, um, in your video, you spoke about your um, you spoke about your uh, experience as a migrant. Um, and there's a um, question from um, our audiences. Um, if you did notice any differences between your adaptation in the new country as opposed to your parents. So let's start with maybe um, your project, mm -hmm. um, working with uh, migrant artists. Can you tell us um, sure. something about it? Because it's, it's really, really, um, I think, relevant to the, uh, the topic and it's also very interesting. Right. Well, thank you again. Thank you for uh, the Virtual Museum for kind of getting me in on that path in a way. Um, and from this work I, I, uh, I, and the work that I started to do that's in your show, um, I, start, I then thought that uh, it would be good to have a, a show or exposition, a multidisciplinary exposition in Canada somewhere to start with, uh, with uh, that showcases uh, the work of uh, migrant artists, uh, relatively recent migrant artists, um, that um, will, uh, you know, kind of tell the story. And as you just said, that story is not always one of suffering. It can be one of opportunity. It can be one of choice. And so, uh, purposely, I uh, purposely also uh, I made sure that I'm, uh, the artists I reached out to. Um, we're comfortable with the fact that they may have come to this country out of choice and uh, it was actually an opportunity for them and something they uh, they uh, they felt they had some agency they were their volition they did it by choice not by force so that's another story that i wanted to uh, to to showcase so right now i have about half a dozen artists and i'm um, it's a growing project so it may eventually have more that uh, are interested and we have some video uh, filmmakers, uh, have some uh, two uh, visual artists. Uh, I have environmental artists, um, uh, digital artists uh, that are interested in, in, in uh, creating and uh, having part of this exposition. And we're in the process where we're getting the information together. And by the end of this month, we will make a submission. The process here, like elsewhere, is you send your material in to a, a gallery that has a call. And we will be uh, kind of pitching this uh, group art show um, to them. And, and I see this as an uh, ongoing process. So it's not going to stop at this one submission. We will continue to recruit more artists and, and then uh, keep going. Uh, to see whether we can show this work elsewhere uh, and keep again this focus that um, um, immigration is a multifaceted and a um, unique story for all of us. It has different, uh, we come at it from all different uh, backgrounds and different experiences. So that's the project that I'm, on go that I'm doing right now, that I'm working on, among others, right now. Uh, and as I said, and I'll be glad to keep everybody informed as it goes, and particularly if it does get a chance to be shown in the gallery somewhere at some point, and it probably won't be till next year in, in any case. All right. So how about your, um, so let's talk about the, the, your own experience. Mm -hmm. And then how do you feel like you, as a migrant, adapted to um, you know the new environment. Right. Have you lost any difference between your your adaptation and to, in, in both, uh, um, as opposed to your parents? Because right. as a generation gap, you were a very young person. You right. experienced a lot at that age. However, you were still fresh, and then certain emotions were not as strong, strongly um, felt or felt in a different way or um, emotions were processed in a different way than 
for generation of your parents and your grandparents. Right. So how did it feel? Like and I mean, it, it, it is it is definitely uh, part of my, of my being. Um, and I, I, you know, I want to be really thankful to my parents, my grandparents. Um, I'm not sure. I'm just. I was lucky. Uh, they were very uh, liberal people. Yeah. So, for, uh, and I don't. You know, like I said, I'm not sure. I, but they were. From the onset, I never experienced um, prejudice or um, anything related to it from my parents. Within their, their, their life, they welcomed themselves. They welcomed people of all races, classes. It was it was and religions. So I I grew up in this environment where there was never the idea of a territory of a, us and them was really. Um, it just wasn't something that I grew up in, um, which I must be very thankful to them uh, for that. Um, so that has obviously influenced my uh, some of my uh, my, uh, my my position. Uh, it, it also means that I that uh, I very early on started to react to people that that take these positions. You know that. The, uh, whether it's religious or whether it's racial, whether I, from very well on in my in my awareness, I started to know. You know, where there's no reason why we should be, you know, not living co-inhabiting, living together, and be tolerating each other. Uh, you know, accepting other ways. So, uh, and that comes from from uh, my par my parents, um, and um, so it came with me. Uh, it also somehow uh, uh, meant that I never developed a strong sense of national nationalism. So whether I was in France or whether I was in Canada, and at some point whether uh, my parents, uh, some of my, par uh, my grandparents, and my actually my parents uh, also at some point made another jump to the U.S. to the United States from Canada, uh, whether in the U.S. I never personally felt an attachment to the idea of a land or a nation. So, you know, it, it, uh, it's meant that for me, you know, I'm, fairly, I'm much more of a, if you want, of a citizen of the, of the planet. And, uh, and I myself tend to feel home is where I'm at, so to speak. You know, it's not one place. And, and that, that even though you know, obviously, we need to have a, a community around us. We have to have people we can relate to, and we can that we can support, and then we receive support from. Of course, we are not individuals; uh, they can survive on our own. Uh, but nevertheless, having said that, I'm not personally someone that uh, feels uh, that this place is the only place or the right place. I know that if I had to, I could I could move if I had to, if that was the right thing to do. I'm not that I. You know, I'm at a position in my life. I don't really want to do that, but but I could do it if I had to, if it was the right thing to do. So I'm not attached to the ground. I'm a, I belong to the ground. Belong the, the ground doesn't belong to me. I belong yeah. to it, so to speak. So so I'm I'm not. Uh, uh, that's kind of the uh, what influences me, and um, um, so it it has also led me to you know to be kind of attracted to working with. With uh, in my previous career and even now, with, with people who are uh, suffering—oh, not necessarily suffering, but who are in unfair, or unjust, or inequitable positions—so that uh, I can, uh, being fortunate myself, from having been able to get the education uh, in the system that allowed me to to uh, to have a privileged, comfortable life. Uh, and to continue to do that, I uh, I also even during that time was uh, wanting to work with uh, uh, with people and work also with issues of inequity uh, in our and trauma, um, so to help uh, people in, in the healing. So all of that together obviously washes down into my work, and it, it kind of are the topics that I'm drawn to that I uh, because I. 
you know, basically that's what I've lived and that's what I, I've, uh, uh, I've gravitated towards. Um, um, so it, it, it definitely, uh, it's definitely been part of my story. Yeah. Um, you, um, I love the fact that you, you called the artwork, um, after Homer's Odyssey. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about Com uh, the Catalonia because it shows how early we started talking about, um, you know, migration. Because this is the this is such a <laughs> such an old work, and it's so relevant. It's always been um, in our story because our story um, as a humankind is a story of moving around. Um, migrating um, right now what we do we can check our DNA for to trace our predecessors and see where we came from originally mm. and it's it's really interesting right because um, but it also I feel like people that should actually do this kind of text the tests will never do them I would never have them done right. I, I'm thinking about certain people that feel strongly about you know you know national values um, yeah. like too too strong to, in my opinion they should actually have a check to see what what's been happening with them what what, what made them who made them and how you know how they should address the match a top topic of migration right. um i feel like your initiative of um having um working with migrants is absolutely fantastic because um any of the migration uh, museums that I um, came across was just talking about, you know, history of migration relevant to a certain area, whether it's like American migration, Canadian migration, whatever, yeah. Polish migration. So we, we talk about facts. We don't, we show certain images of people and it's still heartbreaking, but I feel like as we as we face this crisis this ongoing crisis has been it's going to be a crisis for such a long time because and it's going to be so much of it right. because, because of the climate change because of political uh um issues and we're going to see it more also because our media work better and we get the information quicker um we have to start talking more about it so we know we learn from history uh, from our own experience, from experience of our uh, parents, grandparents, and other generations, what to do, how to, as you said, how to prepare yourself for what's happening, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's it's extremely important. So um, it's very, very difficult, but and it's also very beautiful, and it's very important that we have this art that talks about such a great topic, such a big topic, such an important topic, but we, I feel like we, with any of the artists, with any of the artworks, we hear different voices and we can see um, the bigger picture uh, better. Um, so that's great. Um, can I, because this, this has been a very, very intense talk and very serious talk. Can I just mention Dr. Legume or is it, Right. Is it okay if I do? Sure. Because I feel like we it's I feel um it's it's so important. I mean it's it's such a big topic, it's such an important topic, but I feel like we mm. need something brighter um and something because anybody that sees and l listens to us now, like Pierre has um very like he talks about important issues um important to to human beings um and it's 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 very smart and it's it's very um deep but it's also quite heartbreaking sometimes but there's a there's a there's a bright side goofy side to pierre's creations which i love mm -hmm. and i've <laughs> seen this just okay. like there's a there's an artist or plastic surgeon called um, Dr. Legume, Mais who, oui. works, uh, who works uh, with um, uh, the, the legume uh, vegetables. <laughs> uh, 
And um, if it's okay, can I show a short clip? <laughs> if you want, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, just before you do, before you do, just one thing. I think yeah. you can so the, the, the issue around genetics and migration is an interesting one because uh, we are all everybody is a migrant i mean if if you push it if you push a genetic thing far down enough it you know somewhere in africa probably is where our genes start uh, kind of your lineage starts and then it goes all over the place so i mean this idea again is that uh migration is just a, it's a good thing i mean actually we wouldn't be where we are if we were not able to migrate as a yep. species so uh and this idea about purity, I mean, is a, of, of genes and so on, it's a bit of a negative, a sinister thing. People look for purity or something like that. And that's that's just bullshit, right? I mean, yeah. we're, we're all <laughs> products of migration. Oh, anyway, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we yeah. all, um, that's what I want to say. We all mix of languages. We all mix of cultures. We all mix of uh, places we came from. Right, right. Let's embrace it. Mm -hmm. Let's embrace it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then I'm gonna, um, <laughs> Dr. Legume, um, I would uh, show something about um, earthworms. Oh. Uh, Dr. Legume, that Dr. Legume doesn't only uh, make plastic surgeries on vegetables. Right. Right. There's a, a issue of um, earthworms and yeah. money, and I think. <laughs> yeah again uh, you know just going back very briefly to if i look at a topic if you do show earthworms earthworms is about uh soil fertility or soil infertility caused by the chemicals we put in our gardens that destroys uh earthworm population and then creates soil infertility so how to address that uh in an artistic way and collaboratively with earthworms that are unharmed. I just want to make sure, make sure I do not harm ethically. I, work, I do not harm the earthworms, but they do make the painting uh, that you may be watching. And uh, the thing to do in the, if you watch the video is how the earthworm or the compost worm avoids the area on the painting that has a chemical in it. The chemical is what you, we usually lose: insecticides, fungicides, herbicide, all the stuff that you can buy the, at your at your garden store. Uh, when you put that on the ground, it might kill what you don't want to kill, but it also harms the, the earthworms. Okay. Um, I'm going to show everyone. This is a it, short one. This is going to be... Um, if you can find a short one, the recent ones are kind of short. There's about three of them that are pretty short, one minute. Um, yeah. This is number two, 22. Uh, yeah. So this one is uh, is fairly short, uh, and the symbols I paint all type of different symbol symbols. And this one is called currency print. So what you'll see is the symbols are the currency symbols: dollar signs, euro signs, uh, pound. And uh, I put the earthworm in this case. The earthworm is in black, non toxic paint, or rather food dye. It's a food dye. And what you can see very quickly is that the uh, uh, this is sped up, of course. They don't move quite that fast, but uh, you can see them come close to the uh, uh, come close to the sign. The signs are gold paint and insecticidal soap, concentrated insecticidal soap. And as soon as they come close to that, uh -uh, they don't. You know, the skin picks it up and they move away. And so they create lines um, that. Uh, um, um, you know, when you look at the painting, it looks like a bit of an abstract painting, uh, and uh, it makes, uh, of course, so that's the final kind of image when it dries up, and um, uh, you go through that video. Yeah. Um, I feel like what we, what you said before, that we have to get ready for the um, migration, for more migration that... Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are facing right now. I feel like these guys that you work with, like used for your um, artwork, the, right. the worms, are so important right now uh, because what they do, they work with soil, 
they make it fertile they make it uh, they, they, ma they make it work for us so we can actually uh plant trees plant uh, you know um, uh, um, um, um plants and we can feed the people right and if uh, so these are little heroes that we will need to work with Correct. so that we you know so eventually we'll be able to um work with people that actually come and relocate and we have to feed them all because certain parts of a of our earth will not be really good to live in because because we just totally destroy them to so these are little heroes mm -hmm. that you work with right now um that will be you know bringing us our you know help to uh, create food to feed everyone that needs that right um so yeah that's what i think yeah. and i think it's the, the absolutely wonderful and the artwork yeah. is great so I'll, i i really needed to share yeah. i mean it, it all ties together with what we're talking together in a way we're talking about is this becoming much more uh, accepting of this interdependency with our environment with all, all we're all connected yeah. you know and, and it's when we start treating us each other or the animal all the organisms we with we live with as something else as something that's not us then we get into difficulty because we start treating them with lack of respect and we devalue their contribution you i all the listeners would not be able to survive or to live on this planet if it wasn't for ultimately at some level for the earthworms and what they do yeah. to the to the ground to the bacteria the bacteria that are in our body the bacteria all around us uh, all these things that we tend to kind of ooh not them well they're part of us and they're they're they deserve to be uh, to be thought about and lived in a, lived with us in a respect kind of a thoughtful and respectful way not that doesn't mean that we don't have to sometimes uh, uh, I mean, nature is also a sinister side. It also will attack, uh, and in in a big scheme. So it doesn't mean that sometimes we don't have to, with a virus or so on, take precautions. But but it's uh, the majority of what is out there is for us to live with. And uh, and when we don't do that, we also end up creating other problems, uh, new mutants, and other kind of things that are not not uh, not for us. So so it's. Um, it's all related it's all related about this uh, this uh, changing this uh, way we look at things from the human and the rest of the world to we're just one part of a big thing and uh, and if we can always think of being respectful and mindful of whatever that other is uh, it's it's going to help us thank you um guys just to let you know i um posted I hope it's fine with you, uh, Pierre, that I posted a um, link to your uh, earthworms. So if anybody yeah. wants to sure. see them, there's a whole YouTube channel of Dr. Ligun. Yeah. Also, if you haven't seen the exhibition um, and Pierre's works, um, I really, really um, invite you to see it. It's on our website. Um, it's great. However, you need a little bit of time to see it because there's lots of material. Yeah. But guys, uh, since this is something as as we just said we all are migrants whether it's just part of our dna or mm. part of our experience or experience of our parents or grandparents um and this is something that's not going to go away um we facing we have to understand certain um you know things that happen around us whether it's a good migration a positive thing or it's something extremely dramatic Mm -hmm. um, this is part of our experience, of a human experience. It's part of our life, and I feel like uh, what artists like Pierre do, that face this topic and talk about it, it's extremely important. Um, it's it's great, and it allows us to create this discussion and think and look at things from a different perspective. So. If there are any other questions, I can't see any. Um, I think we can wrap it up. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah. 
Uh, no, I mean, I just uh, will maybe one little plug. Uh, I will be going back to Catalonia uh, and teaching a class. Uh, the, uh, this is the Ionian Art Center, I O N I O N, um, in early February, uh, sorry, early September. You know, if people are interested, uh, the I think it hasn't quite gone up on their site, but it will be going up uh, uh, shortly, I hope. Um, and um, it'll be a fun, hopefully, experience. And I will be doing actually some earthworm paintings there. If people want to actually uh, uh, make their own paintings, hopefully that will happen. I will also be doing some environmental installations in the local village and so on. And there will be a wine making festival as part of it. So you can't lose. <laughs> you can't lose if you'll be part of it. Uh, so that's uh, early September. Uh, and I'll be sure to let people know when I have the actual formal invite and so on if people want to come in and uh, and participate there for that week. Uh, and other than that, we just keep on you know going. And I again want to thank you and uh, and uh, the uh, and the museum for the work that you're doing and and the topics, the important topics you keep exploring. Uh, I mean, art is is our survival. You know, art is the way to our soul and. Uh, and if we don't, uh, we have to continue to cherish it and, and, and promote it so it allows us to, to uh, it, I think art will allow us to make the right decisions. Yep. More so sometimes than the facts and the science. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, in, in the local tradition and the indigenous uh, uh, people, Squamish, and uh, people, their, their way of saying thank you and, and goodbye and so on is, is by showing both hands that way. So. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pierre, for showing your artworks. Thank you for agreeing to talk to us and sharing your stories and your arts with us. And thank you very much um, for all your work you do. Okay. And thanks, guys, for listening. And um, i see you sooner than later. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. I will. I will. Thank you. Bye-bye.